In 1980, militant atheist Brian Melvin died of cholera and found himself floating above his body. To say that he was shocked would be an understatement, but his bewilderment quickly turned to terror as he was headed towards the depths of hell, seeing things that are better left unsaid and names that will leave chills down your spine. His story is one of the most unbelievable ever told and serves as a stern warning to all of us. Hello and welcome back to the Almost False Podcast, where I interview regular people with incredible stories. Today, I had the privilege to talk to a man who has one of the craziest testimonies you probably will ever hear. Whether you're an atheist like he was or believe in some version of the afterlife, this interview will most certainly challenge your preconceived notions of death. And even though he talks about things that are quite frightening, his message is not one of fear, but one of hope for all who are willing to listen to it. With that said, let's jump into the story of Mr. Brian W. Melvin. So I was at work and how all this happened because I had an after-death experience. And someone said, Brian, you, know, you didn't have a near-death experience, you had an after-death experience. And mind me, I was an atheist. I wouldn't believe myself back then if I heard myself speak now. That would be me. Be, you know, just as militant atheist, when you die, you're a dead hunk of meat. That's what I thought. You, know, you just don't you, you non-exist. There was all morality was subjective. There was no real objective truth other than, but I knew there was objective truth because I knew well enough that if you jump out of an airplane at 30,000 feet in the middle of the ocean without a parachute and with no clothes on, you're going to be absolutely dead when you hit the, hit the water. So I knew there was some absolute truth, but I thought we live in a, in a subjective reality. We make our own reality. So anyway, so here I was working at the construction site and our supervisor was a Christian. To make a long story short, we tormented him, but he never got fired. He had a, a, a CBN, a Christian Broadcasting Network, bumper sticker, turn or burn bumper stickers on the back of his work truck, all those things. And we, we ridicule him. We, you know, we, I kind of feel bad about that now. But anyway, he took his truck down to Nogales with his boys uh, to down to Mexico. And Dallas is not that far from Tucson anyway. And so we just, he went there. I didn't know, I didn't know any of this stuff. So he had the company cooler and his car overheated. So he filled it up with some creek water or whatever from that area, from Mexico. He brought it up over the border for, to, for his car to overheat. He kept it in the back of the pickup truck, but he always had another cooler what we can drink out of because in Tucson, working construction, you have your company's cooler was in the back tailgate and it's orange and you know it's safe to drink. He had another one that I always kept in reserve that was in the back. That's where the polluted water was. And so uh, it was hot. I remember that day that this happened. There was a marquee across the street. It was 121 degrees. I was doing groundwork, pedestal work at the time. And so we were digging away in that heat. We go, when we went to work very early in the morning, probably around close to four, a little bit before four o'clock in the morning. So we get off about one or two because it's too hot to work. So this was getting, getting about that time, quitting time, not quite quitting time. So we went over to get some water. A guy and I were working in the ditch. The other guys were roughing in the apartments. So I went over there. We saw that. We picked up the cooler. It was empty on the back tailgate. We saw the other one. We thought it was a reserve one. I got it out. My, my friend said, go ahead, take a drink first. So I lifted it up, and I was mock puff, and I was strong as an ox. With this, this, this four-gallon thing, and just guzzled, just took all this guzzles, lukewarm, slimy tasting. And I said, that, that will taste right. The other guy took a drink, and he spat it out, and he opened it up, and this is what I drank. I mean, I, I, I always talk about Darwin a lot but back then, but I drank Darwin soup is the only thing I can say. Um... Had little wormy things floating around in it and a uh, little, you know, like spaghetti, living spaghetti noodles or something. It was flat spaghetti, whatever you call those, swimming in it. And then it had um, algae in it and it was percolating inside this hot cooler in that hot heat and little things swimming around in it and it stunk horrible. And I drank a good bit of that. Yes, and next thing I knew is uh, later I contracted cholera and I wrote down what I had. From that, I know I also, when I diagnosed me, had some type of dysentery, but I can't remember what it was. And I had some type of neurotoxin from this particular type of allergy. But you didn't die right away. So 
I don't, I don't fully understand how cholera works, but I would like you to explain how the disease kind of develops and how your symptoms were in the beginning, few hours, and after that. It comes on rather quickly. But when I first drank it, you know, it was quitting time, so I went home and I thought if I could just drink some Jose Cuervo, Jack Daniels, and, and maybe some wild turkey, some liquor, it would just you know be the John Wayne cure and the alcohol will cure, cure anything. It didn't. It made it worse. So it was about... Almost 10 hours, 12 hours later, I was back at the early morning job site. We were doing trim work inside of a model home, and the first wave of symptoms hit. And basically, how t- cholera works, it, it lasts about seven days usually. And in the third or fourth day, you go a little longer, but in the third or fourth day, your symptoms will go in remission, and you feel great. And you can read about settlers who have uh, who got cholera coming out west or even in the, over overseas, you feel great, you get up and you walk away, and next thing you know, you collapse and you die. And that's what happens to you when you have cholera. That's pretty much what happened to me. So I got very sick at the uh, at the home, I, the model home I was at, and made a mess there and I couldn't do anything. So I took off work early, sicker than sick, and got home and Next day and the next day, I was uh, in terrible shape. Meanwhile, my two friends were uh, made arrangements with a relative, one of their relatives, to go to Phoenix to fly in a small plane to go up over to the Grand Canyon, gas up. We could fly, actually, at that time, you could dive into the Grand Canyon and stuff and small aircraft. That's all outlawed now. But anyway, that's what we were planning to do. We're going to have a great all weekend on this. But I told him, you should guys go ahead, you know, don't mind me, you know, I'll be okay, I I can tough it out. I was, and they kept shaking their head, and they wanted to take me to the hospital, I, did, I refused. And then I, then the, the part where you go into remission, and you feel great, you don't have any symptoms. I got up out of the bed and drank some water, told them to go, I said, I'm all better now, you can see it. They shook their head, they agreed, and they drove away, but they made an, I had a neighbor next door to me. And the other duplex would come over and check on me. So they had all that arranged, which at the time I don't remember it, but they did because he found me. And so uh, what I'm about to reveal to you may be unbelievable and you may disagree with me wholeheartedly. And I certainly do not mind. Um, but I will just tell you exactly what happened, how an atheist died. And so I was on my bed. I had one last attack and then they, they drove away. I fell on the kitchen floor watching them drive away took me a long time to crawl into the bathroom and um, the symptoms that I had was like razor blades in your gut like something wants to it's like the movie Alien wants to pop out of your belly that's the only best I can describe it's like razor blades sloshing around your entire stomach and all throughout your entire intestine then it would build up and you vomit and you'd have diarrhea at the same time my diary was like you take rice and you rinse the water off and it has this milky color to it <laughs> with a little touch of brown and a little bit of blood in it from the dysentery, which I didn't know what I had. And at the time, until I was diagnosed. So that's, I was going out both ends. And so I collapsed in the, on the bathroom floor and I woke up with my head against the door. My, I had a German shepherd. My dog was scratching on the door. I managed to open it, cleaned up everything had pine saw and stuff. I cleaned all the toilets. That's what I did. I just did all this myself. Don't know how I did it, but I did it. But I didn't want anybody else to get sick. And so we cleaned all this stuff. And I crawled back out. And maybe just a few feet from the bathroom is maybe six, seven feet into the other bedroom where my bedroom was. And I got myself, pulled myself up on the bed and got in there. I was in excruciating pain. I had a high fever. Put all the blankets and sleeping bags on top of me because I had the chill so bad. My teeth were rattling. And my dog was very concerned, whimpering and barking and uh, very distressed. And I couldn't tell my dog to, you know, lastly, go get help. I could hardly talk. And then I remember seeing my dog whimpering, sitting on her haunches, looking at me. So I reached out my hand to pet her chin. And I took my last breath and I saw my hand come out of my hand. My hand was this way. Then I saw my hand come out, went through her chin. And she didn't even, my dog didn't notice. (laughs) And I just like took my last breath and it was an amazing thing. Everything got clear. I'm nearsighted. I could see across the room. I could hear perfectly. 
I was, I, all of a sudden I became more alive than I am right now, than you are right now. Anyone, anyone watching this, listening to me, I was more alive than anybody in the world. I actually was like awakening into a new reality. This is an ultimate reality. And I was more alive than I am now. The sense of being alive was so strong. I wasn't dead. I wasn't a dead hunk of meat. So I lost my atheism when I took my last breath. I floated above my body. At the time, this is 1980, when this happened, I didn't, near-death experiences were not heard. Very few people ever heard of them. I never heard of them. And, and I wouldn't have believed them at the time if someone told me. And so I had no preconceived notions, had no knowledge of these whatsoever. And I died as an atheist. So I took my last breath and I was floating above my body uh, against the ceiling. And the ceiling is a swirled texture. And so I turned my body away from my dog and noticed that I was looking intently at a fingerprint inside one of the folds of texture. After I came back to life, I got on a, a ladder, looked at the very same spot. You have to put your head against, press it against, real hard against the drywall, looking right at the right spot to see this fold of this fingerprint that's in there. Exactly what I saw. And then I turned and saw that fingerprint, looked around at my dog. I could see what I looked like. I didn't look too good. You know, I had, I, how did I start? It was, it was a very kind of a weird palish gray with uh, blue as a blotch is in my skin. I was totally dehydrated. If you could pinch my skin, it would not come back. That's what cholera does. That's what you die of. Right after you have that relapse phase is when people die. And so uh, my, my, my experience is consistent with the common, <laughs> what people go through a bad case of cholera. And you know, a lot of people, most people don't survive it. And plus what I else I drank, that neurotoxin from that, I call it reddish brown algae. Um, and all those things I drank, and parasites, ugh. Um, the dysentery, all thrown in. And so I took my last breath. I was floating above my body. I looked at that and I go, all I could see was my hand in my face. And that's what I saw. I said, man, I look like, I look horrible. And, um, with a shot to see your own body with your own eyes, everything's clear and you're alive, more alive than you are now. And you knew you're dead. So I was no longer an atheist. I said, this is, this is cool. There's no more pain. I have no fever. Then boom, I went through the ceiling and then I was in this, in this, this peaceful darkness, as I call it in my book. And I was just floating down or up. I couldn't tell you the direction, but it seemed like I was just, just going someplace toward a light. Again, I knew nothing of near-death experience, never heard of anything about going toward a light, nothing like that. And I would not have believed it if I did, you know, I wouldn't. If I heard it, I wouldn't believe it. So anyway, I just floating around toward that light, and I could, I felt great. I really did. I said, this is neat. So I thought I was on my way to heaven. <laughs> That's what I thought. You know, this, the must God stuff must be true, you know. And it's just, I was just moving right along, and I could hear this beautiful choir singing and these instruments. I'm going to play the guitar, so I'm a little amateur musician. And so, you know, I hear these instruments you never heard before, people singing, and, and they were singing the, explaining God's character traits, who he is and, and what he's like. And it was, you know, like he's just, he's so just, he allows free moral will. Those are the type of things I was hearing. And then I, Every I call to get a shutter now, and then I knew I was uh, I was approaching this light. It got bigger, and it gave me the shutters a little bit. And then I calmed down. I thought this is cool. This is peaceful and stuff. It was like a little life review in your mind as you're floating, hearing the music, and you could see yourself as a kid or whatever, and events in your life, and um, and things. You know, I would see when I was drunk driving down on a Gallows Road in Virginia in Falls Church area. And there was a hill, and I flew over the hill and went airborne too fast, heading toward an oak, oak tree. And he spared me, showed me that some some type of angel was there, took the car and moved it slightly over so I wouldn't hit, I wouldn't hit anything down. Because all these kids in the car would have died with me, that right then and there. So those were the things that were going on in your head as you were approaching this light. Yeah, he, it was it was like a life review, and and you heard a voice. I wrote it in my book the best way I could. I, it was like a voice coming from the rock, 
and it would speak to you these things and would show you yourself and showed you how many times the Lord reached out to you to try to get your attention. And we, I didn't pay attention to any of it. And so here I am. I didn't know any of this stuff. And I was, and I realized I was going, I was like, something wasn't quite right. So I, I saw the per, I saw the light was coming from a person standing on a rock suspended in space. And then I landed feet first before him. And then I, he came, he walked down off this little, like a rock seat that was on the side of a wall. And he walked down toward me and he had a hood on and I fell face first, flat on my face. I couldn't stand up. Something or someone picked me up was like, I always say it's like a hand with crazy glue on it and picked me up with force and stood me on my feet just like real forcefully. So I stood before him. I knew it was Jesus. So I just knew it was him and you just do. <laughs> and I found out that God's love was judging me. And what was explained going through this void was how good God is in his character traits, how I live my life pitting God's character traits against each other without even knowing I was doing so. God, if you're so good, you're not uh, allowing kids to to die or anything like that. Everything would be, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have this mess. There would be no wars, all that stuff. But then he shows you that we are the ones who did, did this. We're the ones who create all this stuff, but he's trying to get us back on track. And, um, and all that is explained to you in a degree and level that, that, that is profound. And now I was being judged and I saw myself, um, just my real condition. I was, a, I was, I was a wretch. I saw what I really was like on the inside. And so if I was shown grace and allowed, allowed into heaven, this is what I was doing. I was demanding God to conform to my idea of love. You better let me in at all costs. You can't be this guy. You have to let me do what I, I want to live my life the way I want to live it. I want to get to heaven. So I, I make you in my own image of this idea of love. And that was not wholly out of me because I saw how wicked and stupid I was doing it. And so, you know, you make something in your own image and likeness and call it God. And you're, you have to let me into heaven and because I'm such a good old boy. I did a few bad things. Who's, you know, you know, I was uh, sticking my finger in God's eye, challenging him. That's exactly what was shown to me. And he showed me all my bad traits. And so then he, then he, then he spoke to me. He said, um, you'll see a land. That's best forgotten, but not to be left unseen. When you arrive at this place, say my name and my title. And there's no one that speaks like Jesus, even in the Bible. It tells you how uh, the spies went out to spy on Jesus from the Pharisees and scribes to try to entrap him. They came back and reported, there's no one speaks like this man. You know? It's like no one speaks like him. Because what you hear, there's, it is like enters into your mind, huge paragraph encyclopedia fools warehouse fools of encyclopedia of meaning in those words and they cut right to the heart so that's the first thing that he told you he's told me other things but that um he didn't really have to speak i was under judgment and at the time i only shared this in a very few places but at the time it was i could see uh something that was around jesus but was a part of him but not and then behind, he was standing, I, I perceived that to be the Holy Spirit. There, one essence, is, I don't want to get into the doctrine of the Trinity, but that's what I was standing before. And the Father was a light behind Jesus and was being blocked by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And in the Bible it says, before you condemn somebody to, to death, you need two to three witnesses. So I tell people, I was standing in front of a threefold witness of God himself. I can't explain the doctrine of the Trinity very well. One God, three persons. I can't explain it very well at all. But I sure believe it after encountering it. I never saw anything about the Father, but I felt his presence. It was like, it was, I tell people, Jesus was standing in the gap for me. You know, he tries to warn you all throughout your life and various life experiences, saving you from accidents like that or being beat up real severely at some time in your life or going through some trauma and he spared you from it. And so that time when I died, I was sealed in a fallen state. And there is no such thing as afterlife salvation. I did not get saved in the afterlife. I came back 
I remember him saying, there'll be an option, there'll be an option for you to return that remains to be decided. I remember those words. And then I was picked up on and went through a, like a door rolled up like a scroll. And I was wearing a filthy clothes, filthy like a judo suit, as I always call it, uh, like a likened to a judo suit, just filthy, stinking clothes and just moth eaten and really gross. And mirrored my own corruption, really. And picked up feet first, went feet first through that, and found myself in a tunnel. Here of near death experiences talking about a tunnel and going to the light. This one was just like that, but this time I was going like a, a voracious roller coaster ride. And I remember the sights, sounds, and smells of it. And I knew I wasn't going to a very nice place and did not understand everything he told me or what was going to happen. Really didn't. I just, next thing I knew, I got to the end of that thing, that tunnel, fell through the sky, bounced, got up, looked around, and I said, where's the fire? Where's the pitchforks? Where are the devils? You know, like, you know, that's what I envisioned hell was. But it was a dilapidated house on a hill with a tree, a dead looking tree. Everything's brown and very hot, very hot, viscous hot. And so I got up and looked around and everybody ran out of this house, ran down a slight hill. To me, it looked like a hill and ran up and they slapped me on the back. Welcome to paradise. Don't you feel the love here? You're so wonderful here. You got eternity here, Brian. That's what the way they were greeting me. And I looked like people who I knew who died were greeting me. And that's, that's exactly what I was seeing. And, uh, that's what they're saying. But something about them didn't seem right. It just seemed too good to be true because they had, uh, their, their eyes looked like alligator eyes with these yellow irises, whole nine yards there. And they were staring at me. And then they started to circle me, circumambulate me, and going around in a circle. And uh, this ain't right. And then they rushed me. And I remember what the Lord says, when you feel a sense of over overwhelming, say my name and my title, Jesus Christ. So he gave me permission to say his name. And so I had permission to say his name. So I said, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. The whole time I was there nonstop, I didn't stop one iota. Every time I said his name, those things could not grab hold of me. They could punch me, poke me. I can I can tell you their icy feel to the grip they had on you, the pressing gloom was on them. Now all these people transformed into their they were just demonic beings giving the illusion of people and very hideous looking things. And so they are surrounding them, they wanted to tear me up. I said in the name of Jesus, they left me they couldn't grab hold of me, which means a lot. So this one entity came up to me about about four foot eight. I later in and I called a lizard breath. That's my nickname for him. And not because I'm trying to be cute or funny, but I just, he had the worst breath he ever smelled. That's why. And so he um, came up to me and, and said, he offered me half the kingdom, come follow him. Stuck his hands in the side of the wall and it looked like the horizon. I thought I was outside, but I guess I was in the cell. He opened it up and he stepped out of it. He motioned me to come. I still see it today. He looked like a little dinosaur. And this happened in 1980, so 2006 or seven had a grand opening for a sculpture park here in Loveland. I was walking along with my brother-in-law, so that that statue looks like close a representation of what I saw down there. It's in the African art section, and, and it was in Swahili. It was called the Traveler, one who escorts you into the afterlife. With a little write-up about it, um, the sculpture, and why he painted, I mean, why he sculpted this this art, and it was a lizard-looking thing. And exactly. Only difference, he had a shorter, stubbier tail. He didn't have a backpack on. Or I, can, I can send you the picture if you like. You can see it. Yeah, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see, because I like to picture what you were seeing, and I, I want people to be able to do that as well. So I'll try to give a, a little summary of what I understand, and you tell me if that's accurate. So you get shot down a vortex and then you you go on the bottom of this hill, whatever, the house on the top, these people are around you. And then once you say the name of Jesus Christ, they shift into demons. And at some point, this lizard breath being uh, offers you half of his kingdom or whatever. And then he sticks his hand in the side of the wall. And that's when you realize that you weren't on a hill, but you were in some kind of cube, I guess, with like, uh, images on the sides of it? It's kind of hard to explain. Um, 
I stepped up out of it, and then I noticed there were these cubes that were stacked six high, just like mine. In my book, I wrote was they were 10 by 10. They could have been larger in dimension, but 10 is easier to spell than 15. I thought 15 would be, but writing 15 constantly was too hard. So in the book, I took the liberty and said 10. I mean, this is how it is. And another person, Bill Weiss, talked about the cells being about 14 by 14 foot. So in that range would be roughly what they were, square. And uh, so inside was what's in your mind. Think of, you know, Star Trek The Next Generation. Think of the holodeck. It would be sort of like that. And whatever was in your mind became your scenery and the world in which you were living. And you're trapped in this small cell and not realizing it at all. You might think you're all outdoors and your time frame where you died with the, and around you'll see people. You think they're people, but they're not. And, and you have entities that are chained to the bottom of the cell to remain with you. Others came in at will through the tops of the cubes or the sides of the cubes, like they just could go right through the wall and enter your cell, and they would do the tormenting. You, what you sow is what you reap. And that was the most unique thing that I saw. And uh, and this is verified in the Bible, too. Jesus said to uh, these two cities, it'll be better than you, than better, better for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you. Because if they heard the, what was preached now, they would have repented. You know, so that tells you something, that there are degrees and levels of, I call, recompense. And it's your own mind with the demons alongside of it that's given you the recompense. Okay, so your own mind is creating some sort of simulation inside of this cube cell kind of thing, and then the demons can interact with it and like torment you in whatever way. Yeah, they can do it. Actually, what's happening is, is found in Job chapter 25 or 26. It says, Abaddon, or hell, the destruction has no covering. You know, and they whirl, twirl, and dance down there in agony. You know, as I'm just paraphrasing, that's exactly fitting because it, it, what's uncovered is your real nature. And so as you're being uncovered, who or what you are, you may st- st- arrive at a higher level in this place and have less torment for a long period of time. And you'll be bored out of your skull. I saw people like that from where I came in at. And then you just intuitively know that the cells simply at some point, they sort of move to the right and go slowly down. Look like to me a what would be described as the pit of hell would be described as a spiral staircase. The cells with sort of stack six high would be in the walls of the pit, just like Ezekiel chapter 32 talks about. Hell being round about the circular pit. The cells are embedded in the walls. Again, saw uh, Isaiah chapter 24, I can't remember the verses, talks about hell being like a dungeon with cells. Uh, Book of Proverbs talk talk about these as chambers of death, like burial chambers. And and you're in there, and it's small, but you think it could be the great outdoors. That's exactly what it was like, what I was seeing in my own. When I stepped out of there, it was hot, dry, viscous. It was so hot, it felt like your tongue and eyes would melt. Then I noticed people next to, to my, that cell where a mine was, people there, and they were, a lot of them were bored to tears at first. And later on, the cells would move slower levels. As they moved to a lower level, the torments would increase and more about themselves would be exposed. Everybody who got there and knew what they were really like, because the Lord does explain that to you. All he's done for you, how you blew it. So you're going to reap what you have sown in life. And all your good works is not going to erase any of the bad because uh, they don't work that way. Because you're trying to erase your bad on your own effort. It doesn't work that way. You have to trust Jesus on that. He makes it easy. We make it hard. Uh, Because we don't want Jesus. We want to do it our own selves and all that. But anyway, I was there and all these demonic creatures rushed me and I got out of that cell looked around and I saw demonic hordes of people and people being heard it and going into these cells. I saw these tornado vortexes like the one I was going in and dropping people off in these cells. And the cells would go in there. It was round about. So imagine a spiral staircase. Imagine the stairs being a slow lo- spiral rung because we walked up to the middle and there's this donut hole of space where you can look up as far as I could look, as far as I down, there was bottomless. 
And this thing was telling me, um, I offer you half my kingdom, curse me, curse God, you know, whatever you do, curse. And this, you know, I'll give you half this kingdom. He's speaking rhymes and riddles and stuff and very foul language. Editors of the book said, I have to get rid of the foul language because it's a Christian book. <laughs> so I had to do that. And so I tried to convey what they were like and how they moved. They're very, very lively, very vigorous movers. They weren't like zombies or nothing. So I was looking around and I was seeing what was going on. And we walked back to the cubes and saw people being escorted, more t- tornadoes dropping people off. And he started taking me on a tour. And we started walking down the spiral rung. And I would say it was about at least a, a mile, a half mile across from the hole. So it was probably like three quarters of a mile to the other side to me. And then what you know intuitively, since it's roundabout, um, there are cells that go in the back. Like a bricklayer would make a curved wall where the bricks would go together. There'll be like little rooms, little V-shaped areas. And that's important because when we, we actually were able to walk between those, come to some of those V-shaped areas later on where hordes and hordes of demons were waiting. And the further you go back to the back wall, of the pit, these got wider and wider. So there was, it was quite, I never, I, I, I can't even explain this stuff adequately. Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to tell you about our extra content on Locals. It's where you can hear the beginning of our conversations, learn the practical applications of the testimonies and get hours worth of other bonus content. All of that, plus the regular episodes without any ads. It's free to join. So why don't you come check it out by going to almostfalls.locals.com by downloading the Locals app. The links are in the description. Now let's get back to the story. Okay, but let me try to understand this because I I don't know if I can picture that accurately. So you're saying this is a giant staircase, spiral staircase. So there's these cubes that are stacked in kind of like a circle and they go gradually down like a spiral. And it's a, you said it's a pretty big spiral, right? Mm Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay. And these go down, and somehow you said that some of the cells could be moved to different levels. They could be moved down the spiral also. It's like a conveyor belt. To me, it was like a conveyor belt of some type. Okay. And you saw people being there. Um, who, what kind of people did you see? I have three in mind that uh, I know that you saw. What kinds of people were they? And how were you able to see the kind of torment that they were living I was permitted, is the only thing I can say, because at the same time, there was, uh, I caught the voice that was coming to me from, from where I left, was speaking to me and giving me a little strength and also rebuking me at the same time. I put that in the book the best way I could. It's hard to explain. But the cells were like that, and you go back behind there, they would open up. And as you go back, you know, you have bricks on top of cells, and, and, and you have these V shaped rooms. Then go further back. So the type of people that were in these uh, cells were a lot of people uh, sort of like you and me in a way, and people from different ages. I saw a prostitute. I was talking about this person. Her mother made her a prostitute to work in the streets of Paris in about the eight, late 1800s, and she was walking down Paris's boulevard in Paris to see the Eiffel Tower in the back. That was her cell. She had a thousand yards stare, and all she could hear was voices calling her. And that's all I saw. I go to the next cell. I could see somebody who was very abusive to their kids. Um, whatever they said was coming back to haunt him. Instead of getting better reform, these people got worse. It was like their real sin nature was coming, coming, being brought out from them. And there was no, you know, they, they realized they blew it too. And that's the type of people I saw. And there's one person I saw. I always conclude this one. We came across these, these cells. We would walk along the cell on the outer, where the circle was, where the roadway was, I call it, or where the stairs would be in a spiral staircase. We'd go to the chambers of death, and I'd go to each one and look in, and I'd get a download of their life history in a heartbeat, or I'd see some of them having signs in them waiting for them, and signs in hell, like, um, I'll go ahead and say it now, I mean, it's John Wayne Gacy, I think he's put to death in 1984-ish, whatever. It was a cell just waiting for him in a lower, real low, low level of hell that I saw. And um, just look him up. He was a, he was a piece of work. But anyway, um, so that's the type of things I saw. And so I was walking down there, seeing all that, and I stopped in front of the, some of the cells and watched things unfold. So this lady came in a tornado vortex, deposited on the road, 
And for some reason, I was granted the ability to see what she saw as well as what I saw at the same time. I can't explain that at all. And so I'm, I'm watching this person being deposited there. They thought they were in paradise. They didn't see where she was. She knocked on the door. Her door opened, and there was her grandmother and all these rel relatives who went on before her who died came up and, and said to her, you know, um, welcome, dear pudding. You entered paradise. Can't you feel the love here? And she goes, oh, yes, grandmother. This is, oh, oh, and this is really you? Oh, yes, it's me, me, it's me, it's me. This is Uncle Joe, Uncle this, that, when aunt so-and-so, you know, you know, and you're back, you know, this looks like the farm. He goes, yo, you're in paradise. You're going to love it here. Can't you feel the love and excitement? And I could see the entities for what they were and the image they were emanating. Still can't explain that in this timeless time of oh, state. And I could see that in this in the scene being enacted out. And I knew her life history at the same time. And so she went into the kitchen. She followed her grandmother into the kitchen and, her, and said, I'm going to bake you your cookies. Let's go outside. Go to your favorite spot. And her favorite spot was close by, what it looked like to her. It looked like a stream or oh, water in hell. There is no water in hell. There's none. But to her, it was like a mirage. She thought she saw it. She got sat on a rock, put her hand in there and pulled out sand. And then she realized that she was not in a very nice place. So she shrieked when the two trees that provided shade turned into these squid-like things with pinnacles and surrounded her. And she shrieked and screamed. And it really shook me up. That's why I wrote about it. I was like, wow, I was seeing her scream that way, a horrible scream. And then um, this is the type of person she was. She would, she, her favorite method of discipline for her kids was a hairbrush, the back part of a hairbrush. And this comes from the upper class people. You said, in this family, we only have doctors and dentists and lawyers. You will not be a fireman. You will not be a spaceman. You will not be a homemaker, little Susie, or in play with dolls. You're going to be a dentist. You're going to be a psychologist. You're going to be making money. And that's how she was. She'd beat that into them, literally. She was not a nice person to her family or to her, to her husband or nothing. She beat the tar out of her kids for if they wanted to be a fireman, like a six year old wants to be a fireman or something. No, bam, bam. She was mean. But on the outside, she was the nicest lady in the world. She baked cookies, or I guess it was grandmother's recipe. She did nice things, member of the PTA, very involved in culture and cultural things, and being a good mom. That's what she gave the illusion of, but she was a horrible mom. Um, she tormented her kids in ways that were just disgusting. I won't get into that. And she thought she entered heaven. You know, if she was resuscitated at that time, and if I was resuscitated too soon, I would not be afraid to tell people to go ahead and die. You're going through the light and you're going to enter in heaven. What she saw, and I think this is the only reason the Lord allowed me to come back, is to warn people. Not all that glitters is gold. If it sounds too good to be true, then it is. You believe that about salesmen and, and used car lots and used salesmen, but you do not believe it come with any deeds. They come with everybody makes it into heaven. There's all this new age garbage they bring into it. And uh, that's a lie. There's a lot of people that have these experiences, and I've come across a few of these testimonies where they, you know, some kind of atheist or, or some kind of person like that, and they die and they say, well, it was so peaceful and you shouldn't be afraid of death. And so I am not the kind of person to disbelieve someone's experience, but I think there's an explanation behind everything. And your experience explains all of that very, very well, because let's go back even to the beginning of what you experienced when you left your body. All the pain was gone. It was very peaceful. It was very good up until you went to be judged. And then even when you entered hell, uh, it looked like paradise. And that also could have been misconstrued as you go into paradise. And so it makes sense of all these other near-death experiences or after-death experiences, which I actually like that term, that people have online and they don't mention Jesus. But the part that's important is that this is just very temporary. And if they stayed longer, then they would actually see what it is actually like in reality. Exactly right. You're, I learned how deceptive these creatures are. I call them creatures, you know, demonic beings, whatever you call them, demons. Uh, they're very deceptive. 
in the deception, they have no problem having doctors to bring you back to life and report on this stuff. Anything to keep you away from Jesus, they will. Anything they can deceive you to keep you away from the gospel, they will do it. To fight tooth and nail for that. And they have a lot of, a lot of these people come back. I was uh, notified by a NED researcher, I won't say the name out of respect, was secular. And um, they want to hear my story, probably put it on their website, but they chose not to because it was a negative one. And negative ones are bad. You just had, you had a mother father issue. No, we never had a mother father issue. I never loved my parents. They loved me, but I was just, got just dis- deceived by the world. That's basically what happened. My parents were very nice. Never had anything against me. Okay, let's go back to the the pit that you were in and the the spiral staircase kind of place. So there's someone that you saw that I want you to talk about because it was a preacher. And I want you to explain that because the people that have been on the channel are going to understand very much how this is very similar to a story that I've uh, done a long time ago. So can you explain what you saw with that preacher? It was a back in the 1830s or 20s. I can't remember the exact year. It's in the book there. I put it in, but for right now, I, people understand. I my wife passed away so recently, so my 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 memory is not as sharp as it is. I'm kind of recovering from all the grief. But anyway, so and actually doing this video helps me recover from it as well. So well, thank you for having me on for that reason. But anyway. Um, this preacher guy is, it was, it was, a, they call it the Cane Field Revival or Cane Patch. I call it, think of the Cane Patch Revival. And so it was in Kentucky and it was swept the area. And so this guy, who wasn't a Christian, who masqueraded as a, as a, as a preacher who came into there, into there and he had a lust for young girls. He was a predator and, uh, and, and, and women. He preyed on women and he fleeced people out of money. And so he used the Bible to do it. He was a con man. And so here he is down there preaching at this place like he did, getting real excited. And all of a sudden, that's inside of his cell that I could see. And this entity came through the roof, landed in front of him, and it had cloven hoofs, looked like your typical devil, and chased him. He ran away from it, didn't get very far because you're in a cell. You think you can run away from it but it put his cloven hoof on there and began choking him. And other times I seen him, I watched him through several periods of torment. And it, what, what people are going through, just imagine your worst nightmare, not able to wake up, but instead waking up to a new nightmare. So one thing is chased by this entity. Another thing he was preaching at this place. Then the people come up with and beat him with big black books and calling them names. And then they turn into what they are, demons, and tear them up. And so this one last I saw him was this entity put his foot on his neck, crushing him for what he did. He, he, he was a child predator for young, young girls, pubescent girls. That's what I, all I can say. I won't get into that. I don't want to see your channel taken away from the tube, you know, so I won't go any farther than that. So, you know, some of the things I saw would, would, would freak you out. It did me for quite some time. But that was that particular preacher. And so I, I come through there. You got a lot of people in churches like this today. To the devil, that's just collateral damage. As long as you can get more people who see the offense or the abuse and never go to church again. That's how the devil rolls, you know. He tries to keep people away. I don't want to go to church because all the hypocrites are there. And that's what you'll see. He'll do, he'll do that plentifully to people. He did that to me. That's why I became an atheist because of it. Okay, so all these experiences, essentially, and that correlates with all the other stories that I've heard about hell. People are there and they're getting tormented by kind of the opposite of the sins that they did. Or maybe doing the same sins, maybe that's more accurate, doing the same sins, but not getting the satisfaction and getting the the opposite uh, reaction. So a negative reaction instead of a good one. But now let's get to the two more famous people that you saw. Because you continued walking along this path road, whatever this thing is called, this staircase thing. And you came across two very prominent people. Um, the blonde butcher, who I'm hoping that you can explain who that is, because I don't know if anyone, everyone is familiar with him. And then Adolf Hitler. Can you explain exactly everything that you saw and give as much detail as you can to give us an idea of what happened? 
Yeah. So we were walking and we go between the cubes. We squeeze between two of the walls of the cubes into those V-shaped rooms and we wind back our way. We go up or down six rows high. Each each level had was six rows high. And so this is in the far recesses of this pit where the cells were kind of pulled apart from each other and they're kind of sitting by themselves. And then you can see the cells above you and below and you can look around. You can see everything going inside of them. We came to these particular ones and I saw this guy fencing in there. He was fencing. He was always losing. This guy hated to lose. And his name was Reinhard Heydrich. And he is known as the Blonde Butcher. He was assassinated um, in 1942 in the Czech Republic. He is the mastermind of the Holocaust, the final solution. He had, I can't remember what year it was, but there's the Juanes uh, convention they have. There's a video out. You can watch it. It's the most intense thing you ever could read how they plot and plan to carry out the mass extermination of the Hebrew people. You can never imagine. He was a devout racist. He, he's the mastermind of that. He put it together. He put, he signed off on it. And he was there fencing. I never knew anything about the guy until later when I came back and I, uh, read about him. He, he loved fencing. He loved the fence. And this, but he can't, could not stand to lose. A very arrogant guy. So he was killed in 1942. I don't know what he's going through now because I know his nightmare would change into another one. And that was one person I saw. The other person, I accidentally let it slip of the mouth because I didn't want to mention him. But when I did a docudrama on me, the guy questioned me and it just came out. Yeah, I saw old Adolf down there, Adolf Hitler. Uh, so his cell was bathed in fire. It looked like inside of one of the ovens of Auschwitz at full force. He being shoved in and shoved out in ashes, shoved in, burned up out. That's what I saw him doing. And so, you know, years later, I trying to figure out why I see this. And basically, what I came to a conclusion afterwards from this and seeing it and come to terms with what I saw was that he was experienced every person he killed and put into the gas and to be burned, burned their bodies to be burned. So he he will experience every person being gassed over and over again. He will experience every body that was put in those ovens. Doesn't matter if you're a gypsy or Hebrew or whatever, they deemed you unworthy, you were going in there and they were going to exterminate you. What people don't understand is what I also saw there was Adolf's mind was that they were, they were doing the world a favor because he believed in reincarnation that they would reincarnate back into a perfect utopian world of, of the Nazis wanted to make a better world for everybody. And they would evolve and come back in a better, pure spirit state. And they would thank Hitler for murdering them. That was his view. I'm, I'm not kidding you not. I found that out to be true. And there's some studies of how the occult world, how these people were involved in the occult world, especially Reinhard Heydrich and Heinrich Himmler and stuff were heavily involved in it. And that's what they believed. And I thought, wow. You know, I, <laughs> another verification. I didn't know it at the time. And so years later, it's a little bit, a little bit. It keeps happening. I keep getting verifications of it like that. So those are two people I saw. What they're going through now, this is 1980. This is 2024. Who knows what they're going through now? I don't, I have no idea. But I know their nightmares would be non-ending. It probably are still going through everything. Every person that was shot, everything that person died, that's where they're going. I saw Japanese soldiers down there. I saw soldiers of old, just like Ezekiel chapter 32 talks about, of the atrocities being enacted upon them over and over and over again. None of them being reformed. None of them coming to their senses. Uh, at all. They just got worse. They enjoyed this stuff. They went, always went back to whatever debauchery or, or depravity. They just got worse. That's what they went back to. It was fully exposed. So those were the two people that I, okay. that you mentioned there. Yeah. That is, that, that's quite intense. And you remember, sorry, I remember in the beginning when you said that you were being judged by God's love. And in the very beginning of all this, you were saying, how could God send people to hell if he's all loving? Um, But now you were experiencing both. So I don't want people to forget 
that this is a part of God's love, as hard as it can be to conceptualize, because God is just. And so injustices need to be made just again. So this is one of the ways that this happens. See, God is so, he, he's far more just than, than what we think. He gave us free moral will, you know, and it's like, you know, you may not believe in the Lord or whatever, or, uh, but you're going to be held account because he's so just. He lets you make up your own mind despite for knowing you will make the wrong ones because that's how just he is. No one can trap God and say, you made me, you damned me before the foundation of the world. You made me for hell. You're for, you predestined me to hell. No, he did not. You sent yourself there. And he always gives you this choice. He speaks through nature. He speaks that this, the choice, he created the choice to come back to him. And it's called the word of God, Jesus Christ. And what he did on that cross exposes what we're really like to each other, friends and family. And through the, through the power of the cross of Christ, he, he peels what we're really like to each other. If you just read Matthew chapter 26 and 27 and say, I abandoned Jesus in the garden. I'm like Peter who denied him three times. I'm like the, the, the Pharisees who put on trial my own friends to, to escape a jam. I lied about people. And I ain't all that in a bag of chips, Lord. Forgive me, he says. This is what Jesus did. He died on a cross, hung between two thieves. He hung up there and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And now he's, he's suspended between God and man, bearing the very death penalty, the wrath of God in our place as our substitutionary atonement. That is a love far more profound than I can wrap my head around, because none of us deserve this. All of us have done these things to each other. And that was the reality of my hell experience because that's what I saw and it changed my life. And so I was down in hell. I saw all this stuff. This is, this is what I came back with. And I knew that I deserve hell. And so there's one particular place I was headed toward in hell. For some reason, it allowed me to see where my cube was and where my cube will be in this eternal, non eternal time state. And my cell was opened, and uh, all these creatures were in it, okay? And this is the part that tears me up. And I, I, after all these years, I still get choked up, and I'll cry. And um, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is what I deserve. I deserve that cell. And it looks like there's a dentist chair. It was a demon, but all these creatures in there. And I did not want to go in there because I was weakening. I could barely say Jesus Christ anymore. I was totally drained. And, and I was totally abandoned. There was no absolute, there was absolutely no hope. This was it. And then I felt a presence come in behind me, and I thought it was the devil coming in with a pitchfork and throwing me in this place, because that's what I deserved. But instead, all these creatures ran out of the cell, and I felt the ground shake. Every step, boom, where the footsteps were going, boom, was shake the ground. He came up behind me. Someone came up behind me and picked me up. And I saw the holes in his wrist, and they pulled apart. His bones were pulled apart, just like Psalms 22 says, a man crucified. Picked me up, and I cried in his shoulder. Really hard. And boy, did I weep and wail. I didn't deserve to be rescued. I know that. I came back from this place with survivor's guilt. PSD, you would not believe. He took me back, carried me out of this place, lifted me up to the center part of the spiral staircase, and went somehow I got back to the cube where I came through, and can't explain any of this. Went back through the tornado vortex, and he set my feet upon this rock. And I'm not trying to mimic Psalms 40 because Psalms 40 is about Jesus, it really is. So it's just not about me. I relate to it. He set my feet upon a rock. My feet were in a miry clay and he heard my cry and he rescued me. So my concept of grace is far different than most people because I experienced it. And so, so when I came back to life and I woke up, he brought my feet back on that rock and he talked to me. He blew on me, and I, and I blew back, fell backwards through the void, and I understood the cross. 
understood it, understood something I never understood before. And I saw what I was really like, and he let me live. I deserve wrath. I don't deserve mercy, but I found God's grace instead, and that changed my life. I don't care if people believe me, call me a liar, call me crazy. This is what happened. It makes no difference to me what a person thinks. So here I am. Next thing I knew, I floated through the ceiling again, feet first into my body. I could not breathe. I was excruciating pain. The fever came back with a vengeance. Somehow I was, uh, the neighbor found me. And this part is foggy. I just remember coming back, landing in my bed, getting up, can't breathe. I don't know if the guy was pounding on my back. I couldn't breathe. Got my breath. Next thing you know, I was standing on the front porch of the duplex. Guy got his truck, took me in the truck. My head was bouncing against the uh, glove box. I was, I died a few times on the way there because I remember floating above the truck and chilling out. And then I go back to my body, the pain and misery. I described the entire drive there and asked him why we didn't get hit by again, getting T-boned or sideswiped by a, a, an old Ford Fury. And uh, White Fury, he said, how do you see that? <laughs> your, your, your head's bouncing against the glove box. You know, well, I didn't really tell him. I just got to the hospital, and there's a doctor from India there. And uh, they revived me, the standard treatment for reviving somebody. Call. I guess the doctor from India understood that I was highly dehydrated because they tried to draw blood. It was viscous. So a lady just put an IV. It didn't have pumps. They just kind of squeezed it. She looked at her timer and squeezed that thing. And I recovered. And um, they gave me medication and stuff. And I made a recovery. I was able, I don't know how long I was in the hospital, really. Maybe it was in only overnight. Maybe it could be a day. I have no memory of it. I just know I did not want to go to sleep. I told the doctor I did not want to go back to the awful place. And told me, asked me where I was. I said, uh, am I in a cube? He goes, no, you're in a hospital in Tucson, Arizona, with this heavy Indian accent from the country of India. And uh, he told me, he asked, who's running for president? I said, Ronald Reagan. Who's he running against? Uh, Jimmy Carter at the time. <laughs> All this stuff. And um, so he said, well, you're not crazy, you know. So I just kept my mouth shut and didn't tell anybody what happened. The relatives were Pentecostal came over. I don't know. All these people knew where I was. My buddies picked me up, took me back to the house. I had several weeks off of work to recover. They gave me paragoric, this blue stuff in the test tube. I took one good swig of it before I left. I had two two vials left. And they gave me belladonna. It was standard treatment back then for this stuff and some other medication for stomach cramps and loss of body fluid. And I could I had to drink Gatorade and some non-citrus type of juice to get my electrolytes. I came back from the bed. You know, my blood was viscous. Think about that. And um, you know, I tell everybody, there's no afterlife salvation at all. I had to come back. Uh, this is great grace on me. Uh, I understand it. And so I, oh, so this is what I said. This is my salvation prayer. I said, um, you know, Lord Jesus, I never want to go back to that awful place. Take me, I'm yours. That's all I prayed. I actually felt a cool breeze come into me in that hot duplex apartment. My friends went to work, my roommates. It was like 94, 98 degrees in the, could have been about 94 ish in that, in that duplex at that time. And, um, I felt good. I felt at peace. It took me a while on my journey to get back into church. It took about a year, a little, about close to a year to get back into church. Because I had a process of stuff. I, I had survivor's guilt. I had, uh, and I, at the time, I didn't know any of this stuff. I couldn't talk to a counselor. I couldn't talk to anybody. Who would believe me? And so um, it shook me up. That's how I got saved in this life. In this life only, that's what everybody else has to do. Brian, your story is, it, to me, is very impactful. And I don't think I'm the only one that thinks that. And it's it's difficult to uh, imagine how your life has changed so i want to ask you how that event transformed your life from how you were living before to how 
your life has been since then? Uh, what's what's the biggest difference? The biggest difference of was is that I go I went through about everything everybody else goes through. It's not easy, and um, I didn't understand anything. I didn't understand about the sanctification process of being transformed into the image of his dear son, where we govern our world by love, joy, peace. We stumble, we fall, and we get forgiven. We, we do better. We'll never be sinlessly perfect in this life at all, but we learn to sin less than the day we did the day before, and suddenly it gets better. I had to go through the road myself. It didn't come instant. It wasn't easy. I was an alcoholic at the time. I, had to, I was taken captive by alcohol. And so it took me a long time to get to church because I had a heavy drinking problem. I did not know how to be sober. There's no way I, I even knew how to be sober. And so when I started going to church, I was in a nice church. The people helped me quit drinking. And it fell off of me. I didn't have any, 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 any problems. It just kind of dropped off. Yeah, I smoked cigarettes and and, uh, but smoking was harder, but I quit smoking too. And, uh, it was through that process of being transformed through this process of sanctification that healed my heart. I found out, I found out how real he is. He's only just a word away from you. He's always there with you. I just lost my wife of 36 years. Um, August 20th, she dropped. And I did CPR for 10 minutes. She had a slight pulse. They came, got her with the EMTs, went to the hospital. They finally, they lost her, brought her back several times. She lingered after that until August 23rd at 4.30, 4 a.m. She passed on to be with the Lord. That was the love of my life. And the only thing that's getting me through is some dreams that the Lord gave me about her. And I remember telling her, I says, I was out preaching somewhere and, and I came across the parking lot going to my car and this guy was talking to me and he's kind of a little argumentative, a little testy, but he's curious about Jesus. We stopped at the back of my car, which was, you know, the car we have and, uh, talking to him and he was just a few cars down getting ready to get in his car. We're talking and suddenly I was snatched straight up in the air and I couldn't fight it or resist it. And then I, saw other people going up with me and I came to what I come to call it was a great hallway uh, it's like a, a meeting area where everybody's gathered to enter into the wedding supper of the lamb you know your bible you know what I'm talking about so I got there and I was asking people where's 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 my wife where's my wife where's my wife and they'd point nod they're the most loving kind people I've ever seen I never seen people this loving and kind before and I walked a little bit it wasn't that far I turned a corner and there she was we hugged each other and then wedding doors open, and we walk through holding hands. And, um, so my wife asked me, she said, where was I? I said, well, you must have made the rapture. Then we call this thing the rapture. So you, don't, you don't have to believe the rapture or not. I'm not trying to persuade you any other way. But, but she was afraid that she would miss the rapture. I said, no, you obviously you didn't miss the rapture. You were there. You're probably just at home like sometimes you do. You don't always go with me when I go preach somewhere. She goes, oh, yeah. And she smiled and turned and started doing the dishes or whatever she was doing. Now I had to hide the interpretation wrong. She was going before me. That has sustained me. That's the type of things that Jesus Christ does for you. It gets you over grief. I'm still grieving, but it's a lot easier. Even doing this interview, doing and talking about Jesus helps me and get through this. And without him, I couldn't get through this. It is hard to lose the, the love of your life. Yeah, I can get bitter, I can get all that, but no. I understand something. It was her time. She's up there in heaven. She's waiting for me. I will see her again. And uh, I want to see a lot of you up there, too. I don't know who you are, but we'll, we'll, trust me, we will meet. Brian, there's a lot of details in your story, and I think there's even more details in the book. So if people want to get the book to get some of the other things that we didn't talk about today that we didn't maybe didn't have time or didn't think of, uh, where can they go to find it? Well, I published my book, A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion, and uh, that's on Amazon.com. All you have to do is just go there and type A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion, or my writing name, B.W. Melvin. And it should come up on Amazon. Order it from your bookstore. 
My second book just came out called Heaven Beckons to, and that one's out now too. It's Heaven Beckons. Well, you know, it's too much glare on that, but I'll, I'll give you the uh, photographs. That's the second one. I wrote that book. That's just recently released. It's like a pre-release date right now. And, um, and so I got two books out right now. I'm working on a third as well. I'll leave the links for people in the description if they're interested in that. And to finish off, um, you know, obviously God had grace on your life and he allowed you to come back. And he did that for a specific reason. So I want to ask you, what's the message? If God gave you one message to, to give to people, what is it? I, I told you about it when we were closing this about the cross of Christ and how he revealed that. What we did, see, people, they, they kind of take the, the, the gospel into and make a formulary out of it. People don't understand it. But when you put it in real words, like Judas betrayed, the people plotted against them. We got to ask ourselves, who have I plotted against? Who, who have I betrayed? Who have I abandoned in the garden into the lurch? Who have I neglected? Who have I uh, stole from? Who have I lied against? It starts to hit you. You begin to see what you're like. That's what the cross does. And it brings you to a place where you say, I know you, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what you, what they do. Now you do. Now you do know uh, why you're, why you're going through the stuff you are. This world is temporary and he wants you to come back to him. It's through the cross, through the power of the gospel of the cross. And people, old timers, you know, taught it the way I, I, I teach it too. But that, 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 that's not, you don't hear that aspect of it very much anymore in many quarters. And so people don't understand the power of the gospel and what it does. And also the power of the resurrection that Jesus wasn't left in the grave. He was, he he rose from the dead so that we rise with him too. So we don't have to, when we die, we have heaven. And we're, we learn in this life of, of how to be transformed and what it means to try to be a better reflection of him on earth, of love, joy, peace, goodness. Jesus said, whoever seen the Father, whoever seen me has seen the Father. That's what he said. And none of us deserve salvation on our own merit. It's only through him. He paid the ultimate price. He, when you see the cross and you see what, one thing you learn is that God is faithful. He's the faithful. You can trust him. You can trust in his faithfulness. And that's really or saved by grace through faith, that trusting in his faithfulness, not by our own works, but by what he did for us. And you be eternally grateful. That's what I would say. I'd just say, just come to Jesus just as you are, without one plea, as the old song would say, old hymn would say. Spend some time with the Lord and ask him to save you on your own. Talk to him. Talk to him like you're a friend. That's what I did the first time I got saved. I started talking to the Lord. I started talking to Jesus. I said, hey, Jesus, I'm talking to you. Do you hear me? And I started talking to him like, I know he's there. So I talked to him. How am I talking to you? I just talked to him all the time. That's all I did. And people would be saying, you talking to yourself? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking out loud. <laughs> I'm praying all, all the time. That's how I got saved. That's how I recommend you save. Spend some time with the Lord. Talk to him. I make it simple. Don't make it too hard. Thanks for watching this episode of the Almost False Podcast. If you want to know more about Brian's story and why he became an atheist in the first place, then head over to Locals where we talked about that and more. And if you'd like to hear another testimony that confirms his, then click on this video or on the link in the description. The two testimonies are not identical, but if you pay close attention to them, they are eerily similar. Thanks for hanging out and I'll see you in the next one. Stay blessed.